Hello, welcome back to the Imperfect PCOS podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Janelle Howell. I am so excited to talk to her. She is expert on all things vagina, pelvic floor therapy, and more. So, and we've been following each other for literally years, and this is the first time we've been able to connect, you know, I say face-to-face, but virtually (laughs) face-to-face. So welcome, Janelle, Dr. Howell. You're listening to the Imperfect PCOS Podcast, where we share no BS science-backed strategies to put your PCOS into remission. I'm your host, Corey Ruth, aka The Women's Dietitian. Let's get into it. Thank you so much, Corey, for having me. I'm super excited to talk with you. And I've been learning from you for ages, like your recipes and things for PCOS, like Top of the notch, top of the notch. So I'm excited to, um, you know, talk to your audience and see how we can, you know, get into a really good discussion today. Yes. Uh, oh my gosh, me too. And I know you've talked about this a little bit, but you have PCOS, correct? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So again, another example of, you know, someone who has the same diagnosis, if you're listening out there, never alone. So tell us, Dr. Howell, how you got into the field that you work in now. Tell us a little bit about what that is. And, you know, there's so many questions and so much misinformation around it. Tell us a little bit about it and how you, you know, in particular decided to to jump in. Great question. So I got into just general physical therapy initially, where it was more so about general movement and function, you know, making sure that people feel confident with walking, running, you know, playing sports and not being in pain whenever they're moving and just enjoying life. So that was my career for, I would say the first two years or so when I finished physical therapy school. And um, I did traveling physical therapy. So I did get to um, sort of test out different specialties. And I got uh, a position with women's health physical therapy. And at that time it was only for bladder stuff. So like- urinary leakage, urinary uh, frequency, urgency, which is like the, the the need to pee like right away, not feeling like you have that control. Mm-hmm. And so I did that. It was only supposed to be a three month contract. And I literally just kept renewing it like over <laughs> and over. Nice. So after a year, I was like, I should probably just go ahead and specialize. And that's when I did my residency in oh. Chicago at Loyola. And then now I'm not no longer working um, at a clinic or in person. I'm doing virtual work, but mm-hmm. still with pelvic floor dysfunction and um, focusing more on sexual pain and vaginal smiths now. Yeah, yeah, I love that you you know you're you you really run the gamut in all of the different complexities that are involved with pelvic health um, and women's yeah. health in general. And I love that you are not afraid to dabble in you know this and that here and there everywhere. It's so needed. It's so yeah. awesome. oh thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you. Very cool. And I love the bladder, the bladder connection, because I think I've commented on like 95 of your posts, like <laughs> how I always have to pee. So yeah. Yeah, uh, it's so common. Oh, I know. It totally is. Yeah. Um yeah. can you just illuminate for listeners what is the pelvic floor? What does it do? Why do we have it? And how, you know, when things go awry. What can that, how, how can that manifest in, you know, uh, someone who's maybe, t- you know, wondering that question? Yeah, that's a good question. So the pelvic floor is a group of muscles. It's not just one muscle. Okay. It's a group of several. I think it's, there's over 20 pelvic floor muscles oh, wow. and it sits at the base of the pelvis. So essentially it's everything that keeps all of our pelvic organs in. So mm-hmm. we've never really thought about it, but like what's keeping all of our organs from just like just slipping out. And falling out. Right. Yeah. And that's the pelvic floor because we have these openings down there, especially as women, right? We have the the vaginal opening, we have the urethra, we have the anus. And so the pelvic floor muscles act like a sling or like a hammock and Mm -hmm. holds those muscles up. So it's a very supportive muscle group, um, particularly for bladder control, um, sexual function and bowel health and and also reproduction so giving birth and all those changes while you're pregnant and postpartum the pelvic floor has a lot to do with it so any changes or dysfunction that we're seeing 
with either the bladder, sexual function, pregnancy, postpartum, bowel health, the pelvic floor is one of the first things you want to check for or look at because that can be uh, manipulated. You can strengthen, you can relax the muscles, you can train the muscles. And so it can really have a big impact on someone's life um, just by paying more attention to this muscle group called the pelvic floor. That is awesome. Oh, so yeah, go to the vaginal Olympics. It's amazing. Um, right. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, I, I brought this up the last time I talked to somebody who, who works in pelvic floor therapy. And I, I just want to preface this whole conversation with the dire need for this type of work. When I, after I gave birth to my son, I could feel serious changes, um, in my pelvic floor that I had never experienced with my daughter. I was you know, a little older, um, it was my second. And I remember right. asking my OBGYN, he's well, actually was a great doctor, but I said, I, you know, I'd love to be referred to pelvic floor therapist. I think I need some help there. And he goes, well, we don't really typically do that. I mean, unless you tear from what do you say? Um, North to South to East to West, we don't really typically recommend that. And I remember sitting there like, that's, that's not, that's not accurate. I don't think. Like, yeah, not at all. I still think I need help, you know, and I was in a, a rural area and there were none where I lived. So it's so amazing that we have, um, you know, virtual resources like yourselves, especially when we exactly. are in a place that doesn't have a ton of specialty doctors. Exactly. Yeah. I think that is, I'm excited to see things changing and really yeah. excited about what I do because yeah. I don't do any in person anymore. And um, that's great. It's great for people like, like you said, if you can access a pelvic floor physical right. therapist, great. But there's so many cities and towns where the pelvic floor therapist is so far away yeah. or the one that's there, they're just not helping. Yeah. Not with it. You don't feel comfortable. I mean, there's so many different barriers. So Yes. I'm really thankful that I've been able to help people, you know, virtually with technology. And yeah. it's just been, it's just been exciting seeing how people can change and transform. Totally. What Was yeah. it surprising to you to see how many women struggle with things like sexual pain or, um, you know, urinary issues? You know, maybe not surprising just because I'm in the field. And right. so, right. you know, like, I'm sure you're not surprised by the amount of women that have PCOS. Yeah, right. <laughs> so like for me, uh, yeah, yeah. The, for me, it's not really surprising. It's just more like we have to keep talking about, like it's not going to get old. Like we have to keep discussing these issues because so many people struggle with sexual pain, you know, lack of bladder control, all of these issues. And they are not issues that are comfortably discussed. Mm -hmm. And that goes not just for someone that you're supposed to trust. Most people, many people are not even telling their partners that they have pain. Yes. Um, they're not even telling, I mean, I, I work with women who have vaginismus, which can prevent intercourse altogether. Wow. Many of them have not, never even told their parents. Their parents obviously know that they're married right. or they know that they're in a relationship and they don't know that they're struggling with a very isolating, wow. uh, shameful sort of condition. And so for me, while it doesn't bring surprise, it brings more passion. Like yes. we have to keep making more noise so that people get comfortable, not just talking about it, but seeking help so that we can live our lives. Absolutely. Yeah. agree. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. It definitely can. There is a, a layer of, you know, when there shouldn't be a layer of shame and, and guilt involved in all of these topics what's the what what yeah. is the most common issue that women come to you for oh oh me now <laughs> now yeah. it's now because I talk more about sexual okay. pain it's sexual pain and vaginismus okay. okay but when I was working in person I was seeing definitely a lot of frequent urination mm -hmm. um a lot of um nighttime urination a lot of just your bladder running your life <laughs> yeah. just like a lot of that like you're scheduling yeah. things around your bladder you're yes. peeing before you leave you're uh -huh. peeing when you get to the next place yeah. I had one one patient when I was working in person she told me that she turned down a job offer because she didn't trust her bladder to make it for the commute oh my god and the job was going to require like this train commute Oh I think God. it was only like an hour or so, wow. but she was just like, I don't want to be having those issues on the train. And mm -hmm. she turned down like this job that she would have taken, but wasn't for her bladder. 
Oh. And it's really not the bladder, it's more so the pelvic floor muscles. That's yeah. a misconception. A lot of people think it's oh. their bladder. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with your bladder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. an internal pelvic organ. Like there's that's like someone having, you know, uh problems with peeing and they blame their kidneys. It's like <laughs> unless you have kidney disease, it's probably yeah. not your kidneys, right? Yes. So um the pelvic floor muscles and and the brain, because if we're struggling with a lot of anxiety and we've trained ourselves to go pee all the time because mm -hmm. we're so scared, then it, it's it's usually the brain, the nervous system, and the pelvic floor. Yes. So those muscles, that's their job to keep yes. the pee in and also to just give us control mm -hmm. so that we can do whatever we need to without worrying about our bladder. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's always a common problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely understand that. And yeah, if if it's, you know, it's a, if it's impinging on your ability to live your life, it's so worth it. Yeah. Help. I mean, my gosh, you would seek help for anything else that would, you know, have that similar impact. But Absolutely. That Absolutely. Piece. Yeah. That is a big part of it. A very yes. big part of it. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are not even telling their doctors. That's how much shame is involved. Mm. It's like, yeah, I'm struggling with this, but uh, I don't feel comfortable telling my doctor. And it's like, yeah. we got to do something different and figure yeah. out how to, because if you cannot tell the doctor. Yeah. Who are you going to tell? Right? Yeah. 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 Your dog. Yeah. yeah. Not right. <laughs> Not exactly. Happen. Yeah. Exactly. As you talk a lot about the potential ramifications or, you know, harmfulness of holding tension in your pelvic floor muscles. How does that, what does that look like? I mean, you've talked about it in relation to, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction, whatever that looks like. I'm sure there's many areas, you know, that that encompasses, but infertility, bladder, bowel problems, sexual issues. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like that tension piece? I think a lot of us yeah. can resonate with that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I think generally what contributes to the problem with pelvic floor muscle tension is that generally we assume if we have a pelvic floor issue yeah. that the muscles are weak. Mm. And so there's, uh, we're already starting from a place of uh, falsehoods. Like we're, we're already disconnected from just finding a solution because we're trained to think if we're peeing on ourselves, um, if we have to pee all the time, if we have prolapse, if we have these issues that, oh, the muscles are weak. Mm. Uh, I need a Kegel machine. I need to start oh, strengthening. Yes. And that, actually obviously will create more tension hmm. if the pelvic floor is already holding tension so in my experience um and I worked with women of all ages it wasn't yeah. like just older women or just younger women right. it was women um and people who do not identify as such from the ages of 12 to 90 so and the biggest issue was pelvic floor tension Mm. There you know, rarely I worked with people who were lax, meaning there was not enough muscle tone oh, and there was too God. much space or too much weakness or the Wild. general public would say loose, right? Yes. That was rare. It was like maybe 15 to 20 percent. Everyone else was holding too much tension. Mind blown. And so, yeah. And so and, and that was causing the lack of bladder control. Right. The prolapse. People think if you have prolapse, it's because you're weak and loose. Wow. And that's also a misconception. We need our muscles to move well. We need them to contract well and let go well. And mm -hmm. if they're not letting go well, that means that they're not also going to be able to contract well. It's like if you're holding your your hand in a fist yes. and you try to lengthen out your fingers, if you're holding out your finger, your hands in a fist all day for like a month, Right, and you try to straighten it out. It's going to straighten out very slowly. Yes, and so we need our muscles to rebound quickly. But if they're holding a lot of tension, they're going to be slow to perform. Right, and that can lead to the leaks. That can lead to the constant need of pain because the muscles are pressing up on your bladder. That can totally lead to pain. Anyone having pelvic pain, abdominal pain, tailbone pain, sexual pain does not need to kegel. Hmm. Um, definitely not as a first, uh, Mind resort, blown uh, again. yeah, yeah. That's definitely not something they need to be doing at the first thing, maybe later on when they fix the tension, right. but it's, it's, um, multifactorial. So 
mental health is a huge issue now with anxiety and depression and not just anxiety and depression, just the workforce, the way that we're geared to make more money, do more, be more, be seen more, grow more. And so it's this constant grind. And so your ner- our nervous systems are on constant go. Yes. And so the muscles are like tense. They're just, wow. you know, wired to be contracted and not relaxed. Right. And um, postural issues, uh, history of sexual trauma, medical trauma. There's the whole host. <laughs> There's a whole host of things that would cause the muscles to actually close and tighten. And so that's actually the biggest problem mm. is the lack of the of wow. the muscles to let go. We If those muscles don't let go, they're going to be tired because they're always contracted right. and therefore weak. Makes so that is a huge problem. <laughs> yes. And uh, there's definitely more education happening with social media. So I'm glad about that. Oh, me too. I remember, I remember growing up reading, you know, Cosmopolitan magazine and um mm-hmm. shape and you know all all the, all those and th- it was always about kegel oh like strengthen your pelvic floor kegel just just kegel yeah. it's just like that yeah. was the catch all solution for any of the problems that we're talking about today and it's wow like that is absolutely a game changer to know that it's actually the opposite potentially most of the time oh tightness. most of the time yes uh, absolutely wow. and again okay. it goes for people who haven't been pregnant and because that's another misconception it's like right oh well I haven't had kids uh, or right. I have kids so right. I I you know I've loosened up or things are different yeah. and it's not necessarily the case yeah oh yeah so. I, I feel like I'm more uptight now that I have children you know? yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um yeah, the, the vagina follows one's personality like, yes. totally. <laughs> totally I know even yeah. the vagina is type a yeah it, <gasps> no, no when I say that that is so real like the vagina is the yes. most sensitive place to anxiety yeah it is like I remember doing pelvic exams and I mm. had to say relax like at least 20 times in one appointment like it was like relax like let go like stop like unclench and, yeah and, and for many people when they tried to unclench they were actually squeezed that's oh how God. disconnected they were from relaxing oh, yes I yeah so it's a huge that. problem oh my god you, we can't deny the fact that we are in this you know hustle culture and I would say this impacts women so much more than men especially as we potentially become moms and we take on, you know, the second shift and we take on career and, you know, motherhood and having to, you know, take on all those responsibilities. But we, we can't deny that, you know, the way that we are being wired now to, like you said, do, do everything, be everywhere, show up, um, do this, be an expert in this and this and this, and then do this. Oh, but don't forget to be a good mother. You know, there's just so many things we can't, we can't sit here and, and ignore the fact that that's potentially playing a huge role in oh a lot of these issues. And PCOS, absolutely talk about that a lot, but oh, girl, that, more. <laughs> that, yeah. that has been, I think I had a few light bulb moments with my own PCOS journey. Yeah. Um, following yourself and also the hormone dietitian, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So you and her have been pretty pivotal with like, some pretty big light bulb moments. When I figured out that insulin resistance was a big part of it, nice. that helped me tremendously. And like it's not so eating naked carbs, I forget how you mm-hmm, guys word it. Mm-hmm. That was like, wow. And also finding out about inositol. I would say those three things, nice. yeah, were like, okay, huge. But that stuff means little to nothing if you are hella stressed. So true. It is so. Crazy. It's like oh, I was I was on it. I remember right before I quit my job, I was ah. on it. I was taking my inositol. I was yes. walking every day. Uh-huh. I was still working for someone else, and it was still like you know a full time right. job. Yeah. But it was working for someone else. Yes, <laughs> and so it's different than entrepreneurship. Oh yes, and, um, I think I was taking like vitamin D and turmeric. N- nothing crazy. I wasn't taking yeah. a million supplements, yeah. and that was like one of the few times in my whole life where I got my period like every single month for like three to four months straight. Mm. I was so excited about it. Right. 
Listen, I quit my job. My period said, peace. No. <laughs> no. My period was like, no. oh, oh, you want to be grind? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's been a struggle ever since. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I'll try to get back on the inositol and like supplement, you know, do the whole supplement thing. But if I'm still like stressed and not sleeping and constantly working and on my phone and Mm-hmm. The body keeps the score. No, yeah, oh yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's so true. Our body is our barometer. Yep. Yeah, and mm-hmm. learning how the stress is related to the blood sugar and like yes. how it's all impacting the insulin um, function and everything. It's just like wow. And so yeah. it, I have so many stories I could talk forever, but yeah, that's that's one that. of the things that I'm still learning. It's a yeah. it's a work in progress. It really is myself included, you know, people see pop on my page and they think that I've reached some magical mythical end destination. And I'm like, no, it definitely looks (laughs) that way. I'm like, I want to be like Corey. Like, (laughs) I know (laughs) I'm like, listen, she has the best meal and she knows how to make (laughs) it look so delicious. I just need to channel my inner Corey. And I do eat good. I'm not going to lie. I do eat good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big part of it. I think, right. (laughs) Yeah. 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 You got to keep it, you know, you got to keep it fun. (laughs) Yeah. There's no way around it. PCOS is complex and multifaceted. What we know about it, including how best to treat it is constantly changing. That's why I've dedicated my life's work to helping women put their PCOS into remission. Inside my signature program, the PCOS Boss Academy, women lose weight permanently without restriction and master their most stubborn PCOS symptoms. If you're looking to get pregnant or want to be a mom in the future, my ultra successful Get Pregnant with PCOS program supports moms to be every step of the way in conquering PCOS symptoms and bringing home the baby of their dreams. Plus, there's an additional weight loss mode to check into. These are all of the science-backed nutrition and lifestyle tweaks you need to improve your PCOS and change your life from a qualified healthcare provider and leading PCOS expert in the field. Ultimately, we are in control of our PCOS, and I would love to work with you inside one of my upcoming programs so you can step into the best version of yourself and start feeling like you again. Doctor, how can you can you discuss for us the difference between vaginismus and vulva? I'm gonna mess this up. Vulvodynia. Vul- Did I say that wrong? What is it? It's okay. I love the effort. It's <laughs> vulvodynia. It's it's no correct. That's correct. Really? All right. And the yeah, That's and the other correct. one is vaginismus. Vaginismus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Vaginismus. Vaginismus. Yeah. I've written them out um, a million times, and I realized because. I don't work in this field. I don't really pronounce it's them. It's fine. I know people who have vaginismus and they're pronouncing yes. it wrong. So there's no shame involved there. Okay, so vulvodynia is essentially whenever there's pain on the outside of the vulva. Okay. And generally it has to be there for at least three months without any identifiable cause. Okay. So let's say you have uh, three yeast infections back to back and you're having mm. burning. That's not vulvodynia because we know right. why you're probably having that burning. Yes. But if it's if it's not that, the yeast infections are gone. It's been going on for three months and you're having like burning, stinging, or even itching around the vaginal opening. Okay. Sometimes people have burning or pain on the clitoris. Okay. Um, there can be pain, burning, stinging on mm. the inner labia, like the inner lips that surround the vaginal opening. Okay. So that's vulvodynia. Vulva okay. obviously is vulva and then dynia is just, just means pain. Okay. So essentially the vulva hurts. Okay. And for a good percentage of people with vulvodynia, they have a tight pelvic floor. Um, okay. Over 90% of women who have wow. vulvodynia have a tight pelvic floor. And this is the number one cause of painful sex for women okay. um, that are not in menopause. So okay we can assume that if someone says they're struggling with pain during sex, mm-hmm. a good percentage of, of, of those people are struggling with vulvodynia. Okay. So a big part of the healing process involves figuring out what's driving the pelvic floor to be overactive, also retraining the pelvic floor through exercises, posture assessment, mm-hmm. um, manual techniques, whether that's internal manual techniques or 
you know, external manual techniques, figuring out how can we support the public source so that it feels safe to let go and relax. So that's a big part of, that's the vulvodynia. Okay. Vaginismus more so is about a barrier to entry. Okay. So sometimes there's also pain and burning with it because the muscles are so tight that it's like nothing can get in. Got it. Um, it was previously believed that it was an automatic muscle spasm, but that's been sort of debunked. Mm, okay. And so, but if we really think about it, if someone's expecting pain because they've had it in the past or nothing has gone in before, then of course you might sort of clench your muscles. And that goes for any condition beyond just pelvic conditions, right? If you're scared, you're probably going to clench up. Yeah, um, there, there are people who have vulvodynia have been shown to have that same thing and that doesn't prevent the insertion so right. with vaginismus it's not really about some automatic muscle spasm mm. it's about for 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 people who have vaginismus extremely tight pelvic floor muscles okay. to the point where a tampon cannot get in mm. a pelvic exam either can happen but it's so painful they're like having anxiety attacks and all these things um, and also it's usually a fear of pain or a fear of insertion. Right. Um, not for everyone, but for a lot of people who have vaginismus, there is usually some fear or anxiety involved with pain, sex, insertion, yep. and then just a super, super, super tight vagina. <laughs> and, and until we get that thing to open up, there's probably going to be still a difficult time having intercourse and uh, vaginal insertion. Yeah. I mean, what that's so life-changing to be able to remedy that I mean yeah 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 yeah. and it was really it's it's so interesting I think it's really my PCOS experience Mm -hmm. that led me to feel more sort of uh connected to women who have vaginismus Mm -hmm. because I feel like it's such a isolating and shameful well I don't know if I struggle with a lot of shame with PCOS um but there is a feeling of like I don't feel woman enough. Yes. Like with PCOS, yeah. like, oh, totally. oh, like I should be able to just get my period. Like this is so yeah. basic. Why? I know. <laughs> like, why can't I do this? Or I should be yeah. able to naturally get pregnant, right? Yes. And, and the same thing with with vaginismus. A lot of women from the people that I've been yes. um, connected with, they report that they don't feel feminine or they don't feel woman enough. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, 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 you know, you learn from a young girl that you're going to get married, have sex, yep. have a baby. Right. You see the movies all the time. You just barge mm-hmm. in the door, start having sex. And when you can't, <laughs> you know, you can't do it. There it right. Is the exactly. Time. Everyone makes sex look so easy mm-hmm. and that it's just natural. Right. And so then when you start struggling with it, um, I guess there could be right. a feeling of like brokenness. Obviously you're not broken, but that feeling yes. comes up. And that's just some of the same feelings I have when my PCL, my PCOS is going crazy. I'm like, damn it, can I just get my period? Is there a reset <laughs> button here? Like, where? Right. Where? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, totally and sometimes cool. people do have both. Um, they oh, okay. can go together. Got and it. they have more recently been lumped into one uh, diagnosis. Hmm. But for the sake of not confusing people, those are the differences between the two. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for illuminating that for us. Is there a, um, yeah. along with obviously the physical components that we, we, someone with either one or both of these conditions can work on, is there also, are there also usually mental health recommendations along with that? If there's some kind of, you know, fear or anxiety or even trauma or anything connected with that, or is that something that, you know, maybe you'll, you'll, you know, talk about additionally but it's not necessarily like a go-to I'm just curious for myself yeah it's actually really common for people to seek sex therapy um sometimes group therapy okay um many times a lot of people have either anxiety or depression so they might already be seeing a psychiatrist or seeing a counselor so it can be a nice uh adjunct but generally we do still have to address the actual pelvic floor Okay. Um, even if the anxiety and fear is overcome, those okay. muscles, it, it, you know, they just have to stretch. They have to open. Like at some point they're going to have to bloom. Yeah. And if they don't bloom, then this is going to be a difficult time just getting things through, through that canal. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, that, that is a huge part of it. When, when they learn those different strategies on how to deal with the anxiety uh-huh. and also even just process any trauma or th- anything in their past that 
may have contributed to, to the development of this condition. It can be, be very eye-opening and helpful to the healing process. Oh, totally. Um, and so I, I totally recommend people to get help. And sometimes if you don't get the mental health component, at least start it in terms of working on it, it can be difficult to heal physically mm. because there's just so yeah. much emotions. There's crying and there's anger and there's, uh, frustration and their shame and so if if I, someone can do both great yeah. um, but if you can't do both starting with one is always a great place as well totally thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. All right, switching gears because I'm dying to talk about this topic yeah. and I love that you talk about this topic when you talk about nutrition for the vagina this is obviously my you know I'm like fascinated in this, this subject but yeah. I love that you, that you really like to do, you know, go into this on, on social media. And I think it's just fascinating. Could you touch on a sure. couple that you typically would be like go-to recommendations that are helpful and why? Oh man. Oh my gosh. Where do <laughs> I, I begin, Corey? Every podcast. <laughs> I oh my gosh. Where do I begin? Okay. So I would have to say that, um, vitamin C rich foods yeah. like blueberries, um, citrus fruits, even cauliflower. Mm-hmm. I know we don't think of cauliflower as like a vitamin C rich food, yes. but Potatoes. you know, just uh, let me let me stick with blueberries. I love blueberries yeah. because you. they're anti-inflammatory. So mm-hmm. this is going to be good for literally any disease. Yes, <laughs> whatever you have that's a problem, you need to yeah. fight the inflammation. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Blueberries are high in vitamin C and vitamin C helps the body to make collagen Mm. and collagen is the protein that's in the wall of the vagina. And so we need the vaginal wall to be healthy, to help us with uh, strength, um, bladder control, lubrication, because that's where the lubrication is coming from. It's seeping through the walls of the vagina. And so if the tissue in the vagina is not healthy, Mm-hmm. then it's going to be difficult to feel like you have good vaginal health and fitness. Yeah. And so that's a big one. It's just like getting enough vitamin C because yeah. you can be eating the protein, but if you're not getting the vitamin C, then mm-hmm. your body may not be manufacturing the collagen very well. Right. And so that's one food that I really, really love. That's awesome. Another thing that I love is salmon. Yeah. Um, I know you have a few salmon recipes. I think I've seen you cook with salmon a few yeah. times. Like you're, you're the recipe queen. I cannot <laughs> stress that enough. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. I need to have an album like just yeah. for Corey's recipe. <laughs> um, yes. So salmon is high in the omegas, oh, which yeah. is like, I want to say omega three for salmon. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that is really important because it helps the body to make hormones. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have enough fat in your diet, and you, I've heard you talk about this, yeah, yeah. then, you know, you're not going to be able to make those hormones. And nope. we need, oh my gosh, the vagina the yeah. and the clitoris mm-hmm. depend. It, listen, if you don't have enough estrogen and testosterone, yes. your, your libido is going to be lower. You're going to have more burning, more dryness, more pain, more, you may even have atrophy. Yeah. Atrophy of the clitoris, yeah. atrophy of the vaginal wall, and that is not fun. No. And so um, sometimes we do need some medical assistance if that's happening. But in terms of how food can support, that's another really good one that I love. Um, avocado, mm-hmm. that's another good one just because of, again, all the fat and the fiber. Yes. And with um, women who struggle with like pH disturbances, whether it's like mm-hmm. recurrent infections, Yes. recurrent uh older like a lot of women say they struggle with like this older right usually that's like a lack of good bacteria in the vagina that's throwing off the ph yes. and so eating more fiber rich foods can help with that because that's going to feed the good bacteria um and obviously probiotic foods i mean mm-hmm. greek yogurt there's, yes. so, <laughs> there's so many things yes. like a lot of the foods that you that you use that you yeah. uh, make stuff with on insta um, so good for the vagina. I, awesome. I think I would say, I would say you pre, you inspired me quite a bit. Um, my first EGOT was 50 foods for the vagina. Um, mm-hmm. eating your way to a happier vagina, like a healthier vagina. That was my very first ebook that I wrote. That is so good. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I love talking about nutrition and how it impacts yeah. our sexual wellness and, um, 
last thing I'll say is this is not necessarily a food, but for me, um, I struggle with prolonged periods when I do get my period. Same. The never ending period yeah, that I'm literally not, does not, not go away. Like literally, I, I don't bags. get out of here. Yeah, I'm like, um, you've been here for several weeks now. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm not sure if that's because of the lack of ovulation or what, but typically, um, so, so with that, I become anemic and this is recently, like within the past several weeks, mm -hmm. my blood levels got so low mm. that I have to go get a blood transfusion. Oh my God. And yeah, but just from all the bleeding mm. and anyway, so I got the blood transfusion and my doctor prescribed some iron. And usually I don't like taking prescribed iron because it makes me constipated or it's too much or I can taste the iron or whatever. Yeah. But this time I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take it with my vitamin C. I'm going to try and be consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just cut it in half just so that my stomach could tolerate it better. Yes. And when I tell you my libido has shot through the roof since Good. taking the iron, oh. I got on Google so fast. I was like, libido is low iron. What's the matter? The very first thing, it was like, yes, iron can contribute to a low sex drive, lack of iron. Huh, I did not like, know well, that. I sense. didn't know that. Like, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I'm like, my coochie couldn't even breathe. It, <laughs> it had no iron. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so listen Make whatever the iron rich foods are eat mm -hmm. them if you're yes. if you're low iron and, yeah. and just period Red probably meat, seafood yeah. um the heme iron which are the animal based iron is it yeah makes you eat beans and spinach till you go blue in the face but it's really going to be the heme sources or supplementing if you don't eat red yeah. meat that are the most yeah. impactful yeah Yes, yes. Yeah. I've been supplementing. I don't yeah. eat a lot of red meat, but I know that that is usually rich in the in the uh, vitamin B's and the iron. Right. And yeah, so. which is also great for a, a ton of things, but you know, specifically right. EOS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. my gosh. Glad you bridged that connection <laughs> and you're on your way out of that. That's not fun. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing those foods. I think not many of us make the connection that what we are eating impacts, I mean, let's be real, everything, but our sexual health. Yes. And it, it's, oh, absolutely. it's something that we never learn. We never hear about. So I just love that, you know, you were the first person to, for me to see talking about that. And I just loved it. L okay. One last food. Yeah. Um, pumpkin seeds. Ooh, yeah. If someone has bladder frequency mm. or if you're peeing all the time, can't control your blood, <laughs> can't control your bladder or, or urinary <laughs> leakage, uh -huh. listen, pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil. Ooh, it's like magic. Really? And it's because of a lot of the minerals yes. that are in there that help the, the wall of the bladder to contract better. Gosh. And so I'm not sure if it's the zinc or any of the other minerals, but listen, just trust me on this one. I even, um, Corey, I think I have an episode on my podcast, Five Foods for the Vagina, my five favorite foods. Oh, cool. I don't okay. remember exactly all five of them, but yeah. um, that that's a, re a really good episode if people are looking for like foods that can have a pelvic floor health yeah. and sexual health. Totally check out that episode. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to link to that one too, because yeah, I mean, I know this is such a, that's such a big topic and you have touched on it a ton of, you know, in different areas. So yeah, oh, that yeah. is awesome. All right. Pumpkin seeds. <clears throat> I gotta, gotta get on. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is clitoral atrophy? You have talked about that quite a bit, um, before yeah. social media tried to shut you down, um, over it, I think. <laughs> Several yes. times. but yeah, yeah. Who, who is affected most by it um what can we do to prevent that clitoral atrophy is when the clitoris uh starts to shrink and um decrease in size sometimes it retracts back so that you cannot really see the head anymore okay. it's not that the clitoris is completely gone like it doesn't just vanish right. but the size is diminished so much and it goes back towards the inside of the body that it can be difficult to find it mm, um okay. that usually happens with hormonal deficiencies okay. um so it could be a lack of estrogen let's say that a woman is in menopause and she's no longer ovulating and there is a lack of estrogen and testosterone reaching the clitoral tissue okay. and so like we talked about earlier 
hormones is what tells the tissue to stay plump and ready for sex and all that stuff. And so that can contribute if there is a prolonged period of lack of hormone uh, production or just lack of hormone uh, binding to the clitoral tissue. Um, So that in combination with lack of prolonged uh, sexual arousal. So if there is a really long period of no sex, not just no sex, but like no arousal, there's no uh, touch to the clitoris, there's no massage to the clitoris, there's no sex, there's there's nothing happening, like there's no stimulation, then the clitoris is not really going to feel like it needs to be there. Right. (laughs) And if if that in combination with hormones, so... And and sometimes you're not even in menopause. There are women who do not respond well to the birth control pill. Mm. And we know that the birth the birth control pill can stop ovulation. And mm. so there's gonna there's not gonna be that spike in hormones, right? When we ovulate, there's like this big spike in right. estrogen and testosterone. When you're not ovulating anymore, it's more like just this long, this flat line. Yes, and no- you're on you're on the pill. There's no rise and fall of hormones. And so oh. Right. Not everyone, and I don't want to scare people. If you're yeah. on the pill and your clitoris is still there and you're fine, great. Right. Uh, but for a lot, for for some women, um, they notice that being on the pill for a prolonged period of time, um, it just decreases the clitoral size for everyone. First of all, regardless, even if you don't have clitoral atrophy, your clitoris will be smaller on the pill because there's less oh. of the hormones, the sex come hormones. Back after discontinuing to. If you have atrophy or just the pill? Um, if you, I guess if you, if it shrinks in size due to the pill and you come off the pill. Um, it it shrinks in size, but usually not some noticeable change. Okay. So yeah, if you get off the pill and your hormones are doing their natural thing, the Got hormones it. are wild again, <laughs> then that usually just does its thing naturally. Okay. Got but it. if someone develops actual atrophy, like it's considerably smaller, for a lot of people, it starts to fuse with the inner lips. So the clitoris starts to fuse with the inner lips and the inner lip starts to fuse with the outer lip. So a lot of people that have clitoral atrophy, it's not just the clitoris, it's like the vulva. Yeah. So it's like, where are the inner lips? Mm. Like they are not there anymore. Are they getting really small? And so with that, generally there's medication that's required to rebuild that tissue. Okay. Um, Some people need surgery to sort of pull the hood back so that the head of the clitoris can be seen again. And so- it it can be older women, but it can also be younger women oh. who just are either on the pill or some women are not even on the pill and they develop the atrophy. Um, so I like to say, um, just check yourself, like check your vulva yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. And you should check probably, out. yeah, check your out. You should probably like do a little clitoral massage every now and then. Because it, it like, and I know that's a sensitive that topic. Twice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if someone's religious or conservative, um, mm-hmm. exercise, if they don't feel comfortable actually touching the, the clitoris, lots of exercise is good. Enough sleep because we actually get clitoral erections when we're sleeping. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Get the water, let the water run off. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, right. whatever you feel comfortable. See what happens, yeah. Yeah, but that's just the yeah. body. I mean, I, I oh, personally, yeah. that 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 God is, that's how he made our bodies. And mm-hmm. if we don't move right. different body parts and we don't use them, I mean, it's just okay. natural that they may weaken or atrophy. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's generally what it is. Can So it shrinks and then you can't find it. Does this happen in men? Because I'm pretty sure it, you're describing my ex- does this happen in men also? I cannot. Okay, yes, it is penile <laughs> atrophy. And and doctors have prescribed masturbation oh. for, for this condition. In combination, <laughs> usually there's like a topical cream okay. prescribed okay. where um they're like, okay, put this cream on the the, right. the vulva or the penis or whatever. Okay. But usually again, we need the blood flow. And so yeah. with arousal, the blood rushes to the genitals and that helps to nourish the tissue. Unfortunately, our clitoris cannot have a meal. Like you can't feed it food. And so the only way that it gets its nutrients is through the blood. And yeah. <laughs> so if the blood is not coming down there, then right. it's it's difficult, right? For it to stay healthy. And so, yeah, yeah men can get penile atrophy. Um, 
I don't think it's as common just because men seem to be a little bit more connected to their sexual health and their right. their arousal and all of that. Like mm-hmm. men, they're they're taking care of themselves <laughs> generally. <laughs> generally speaking, <laughs> women on the other yeah. hand, there's just so much shame and disconnection going on there. So That's so true, and yeah. that could be an entire episode in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. Doctor Hal, thank yeah. you so much. This conversation is. Yeah so helpful and it's just endlessly fascinating to me and I know my listeners are going to find it just really helpful would you mind sharing where listeners can find you and how you work with women and you know work with clients and program members to help them with a lot of the issues that we've talked about today sure so on Instagram is where I do most of my content creation Um, just a lot of education on sex the pelvic floor and just vaginal fitness Okay. And so my name on there is Vagina Rehab Doctor, spelled all the way out. Same thing on TikTok, Vagina Rehab Doctor. Um, right now, I do have a podcast. It just started this year. Okay. It's called the Vagina Rehab Doctor Podcast. So that one drops a new episode every Monday. So that one's cool. um, also very work. informative and helpful if you're looking for uh, tips and stuff on sex and the pelvic floor. And then my website, Vagina Rehab Doctor. So I do one-on-one coaching for women who have sexual pain and vaginismus and who are seeking to enter to a new chapter of pleasure. Um, So that's, that's what we do. And yeah, follow me on the ground. Awesome. Yeah. And I definitely want to link to your podcast as well. So, you know, women can check that out. That'd be great. More resources. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem, Corey.